Okay, so now that most of you are in place, I think we can <laughs> we can get started. Um, let's start our second special session of the day on monetary policy. Uh, we have three uh, presenters, uh, Maria Cristina barbieri Góes from University of Bari. She'll present a paper co-authored by Joana Vritzer on monetary policy distribution and autonomous demand in the US. Uh, the second presentation will be by Steven Fazari from the Washington University in St. Louis. He'll talk about super multiplier models, demand stagnation, and monetary policy, inevitable march to the lower bound for the interest rates. And the last presentation will be by Sergio Levrero from University Roma 3. He'll talk about the Taylor Rule, some further remarks in, on inflation, interest rates, and income distribution. So each of you have, uh, has like around 40, up to 40 minutes, right? <laughs> up to, up to 40. Around 30, up to 40. Um, and then we have, we'll collect uh, some rounds of questions uh, in the end. So Maria, you have the floor. Thank you, Lydia, for the very nice introduction. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, the organizers, for this conference, especially Suma for all this, uh, putting up this uh, great program and all the organizational issues. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today and sharing the table of uh, uh, great names, uh, which have uh, greatly inspired this, uh, this work that I have co-authored with uh, Joana Avritza. Uh, so, uh, the topic of my presentation is obviously on monetary policy, but differently than the other two papers that will be presented later on, uh, this is more of an uh, empirical paper, uh, not uh, so much a theoretical paper. So, uh, the aim of this uh, uh, joint contribution with Joanna is actually to empirically explore the effects of uh, uh, change in income distribution as well as uh, monetary policy on uh, what uh, has been uh, studied in the Serafian supermultiplier literature, the semi-autonomous components of demand uh, in a specific uh, household credit finance consumption, which in this case can be divided in revolving and non-revolving loans, as well as uh, private residential investment and durable consumption. Um, in this case, we also assess the, the effect of these components on output dynamics. Well, uh, as we know, uh, many scholars have criticized uh, uh, the so-called super multiplier approach uh, and challenged the exogeneity of these uh, autonomous demand components. Uh, nevertheless, uh, as recently argued by Serrano, Suma, and co-authors, uh, this uh, exogeneity was a simplified assumption that was made in the simple model and can easily be relaxed. In fact, uh, uh, many authors in both empirical and theoretical works uh, have considered the effect of monetary policy in determining uh, uh, these uh, autonomous demand variables and uh, have relaxed the exogeneity assumption. Uh, in this case, we attempt to explore some connections suggested in the theoretical work developed by, by my co-author and the chair uh, in 2022. Uh, and this is between the semi-autonomous uh, household credit finance demand, uh, financial and distributional variables. So, uh, to do so, uh, we apply structural vector autoregressive modeling on US quarterly data for the period between 1968 until 2022. Uh, we estimate five different structural VAR models to explore the possibility of these uh, autonomous demand components uh, being defined by different variables using this US data. Uh, we do so by relying on private residential investment summed to uh, consumer credit. Then we disaggregate that and do separate analysis on both consumer credit and private residential investment. And we also considered uh, the division between revolving and revolving loans within consumer credit and uh, also durable consumption goods. So this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, uh, as I just presented the uh, introduction and motivation for this paper, I will uh, go on presenting the methodology, context, and estimation objectives, estimation strategies, results, and then uh, concluding remarks. 
Well, uh, we all know that the new Kaletskian uh, empirical literature uh, has uh, relied a lot on tests on the relationship between income distribution and growth. Uh, in this literature, uh, we know that it's assumed that this relationship is determined by the, the specification of the investment function, which is not uh, induced as in the case of the super multiplier. Uh, on the other hand, uh, authors from this uh, super multiplier literature have investigated the relationship between growth and autonomous components of the MET. Uh, in specific, uh, many contributions have suggested that household credit finance consumption and private residential investment affect output dynamics. So there have been uh, uh, a bunch of uh, empirical papers uh, that have investigated uh, consumer credit and private residential investment, either aggregated or separated, or only uh, private residential investment. So, uh, under a super multiplier framework that have also been uh, developed in the literature, a few papers that have explored the connections between the interest rate in determining or influencing this autonomous demand, um, and also the relationship between interest rate and functional income distribution, which is uh, uh, related to a recent paper published by Di Bucchianico and Lofaro. Uh, however, none of these uh, previously mentioned uh, estimations have explored the connections both of interest rate and functional income distribution in determining or influencing these semi-autonomous components of demand and how uh, these components are defined. So uh, the focus of this work is doing so and verify which of these components is most influenced by, by this, uh, these, two, these two variables, so functional income distribution and, uh, and monetary policy. So uh, in this figure, I will use the other one, which is uh, uh, maybe more clear. Uh, I represent what we are trying to access, assess with uh, our econometric model. We will uh, estimate uh, shocks in the interest rate, so in the federal funds rate. This will then have an effect on uh, the wage share, which then influences changes in, uh, might affect uh, changes in autonomous consumption. Uh, so this is something that we uh, want to investigate. Uh, uh, also, we try to assess if changes in the interest rate have a direct effect on changes in autonomous demand, either it be defined by residential investment or all the variables related to consumer credit, revolving or revolving loans, and uh, consumption of, non, uh, of durable goods. Uh, this then uh, shocks spill over to, to the dynamics of output and uh, this can, uh, can tell us uh, if uh, the assumption uh, of the super multiplier literature, which is that uh, uh, autonomous components of demand uh, drive uh, growth or drive the dynamics of output uh, are valid or, or not. So, uh, on uh, our estimation strategy, we use, uh, as I mentioned before, structural VAR models, and uh, before estimating a, a structural VAR models, a VAR model has to be estimated. To do so, we have to also use the Akaikis information criteria to select the optimal leg length to be used. Uh, once the VAR models are estimated as represented in equation uh, number one, uh, we can then uh, assess their stability if uh, the, this uh, VAR uh, is a stable VAR, we can then proceed by estimating a structural VAR model. Uh, to do so, uh, we have to impose um, an identification strategy on, uh, on the beta, uh, B0 matrix in equation two, uh, so that we can orthogonalize the reduced form errors, and to do so, we make them mutually uncorrelated. And uh, to do so, we make use of a recursive short-run uh, restriction based on the Cholesky decomposition. Uh, it's also important to mention that uh, we use, uh, at least in the benchmark model, we then uh, do some robustness checks, uh, we use the variables in log levels uh, to take into account that, that these variables might be co-integrated in the long run, which is something that uh, is plausible uh, if we are discussing the... Uh, the, the super multiplier model. So, uh, more on the identification strategy, which is something that is <laughs> uh, 
uh, uh, can be criticized uh, in the literature on these uh, empirical works. Uh, so, uh, first I will show you the system of equations. So we estimate, as I mentioned before, the system of equations, five systems of equations, uh, representing five different uh, models. Each of the models uh, include the different uh, components of autonomous demand. In the first uh, uh, benchmark model, we aggregate private residential investment with consumer credit. So, that here. And then we consider the, consum the induced consumption net of consumer credit. Uh, in the second model, we disaggregate private residential investment and consumer credit, whereas in the third model and fourth model, instead of considering consumer credit, we consider durable consumption goods. Uh, in the fifth model, instead of using uh, consumer credit, we disaggregate consumer credit into revolving and non-revolving low ones. Uh, so each of these uh, uh, ordering, information ordering here, the order of the variables, are chosen according to our uh, assumptions uh, to identify this structural var. So the first equation of the models, which is the one on the federal funds rate, is simply assuming that the federal funds rate is ex exogenously set by the central bank in accordance with the post-Keynesian literature uh, that tells us that uh, the central bank is able to set the interest rate at a, uh, any level the central bank wants, simply. Uh, this is also in line with recent empirical literature, and, uh, uh, and with this assumption, we are simply implying that monetary policy can affect output and all the other variables within the quarterly observation, whereas the reverse is not, does not hold true. That is, all the other variables cannot affect uh, interest rate uh, at the current uh, moment, so at the time the shock occurs. Obviously, uh, we do... Uh, uh, repeat this exercise. Uh, if, I, I, if I have time, I will, I will show you. Uh, inverting the order of the variables and including the federal funds rate at last, which is considering that uh, we have in place a Taylor rule, which is a kind of uh, a new Keynesian word, so as uh, the word works, and our results remain unchanged. So uh, the results are not model dependent. Uh, secondly, the wage share is assumed to affect autonomous demand uh, within the quarterly observation because we want to uh, actually approximate what uh, the new Kaletskians do and see what happens with the model. Uh, obviously, um, uh, considering the work of Di Bucchiani and Lofaro 2023, that do the opposite that we do, that is, they order the wage share at last, we again repeat our exercise ordering the wage share at last and the results remain unchanged. Uh, we assume that autonomous demand variables have an immediate effect on uh, output where output will have a, only a, might have only a lagged impact on autonomous demand variables. Uh, lastly, following the, the, the works of Limer and uh, Lucas Teixeira, uh, in this model, we order uh, private residential investment first, and then cry, uh, consumer credit uh, second. When we do not uh, use consumer credit, we use uh, durable consumption, and we order it uh, after private residential investment, because uh, we believe that, uh, as Limer and uh, Teixeira have argued, uh, American households first buy houses, and then cars and so on, and this drives the, the whole economy. So, uh, without uh, uh, further comments, I will go to the results of the, the first model. I don't know if you're able to see <laughs> the impulse response functions. It's even uh, very small for me, so I will have to, to describe you and guide to the, to the estimations. So, uh, in the first column, you see the shocks in the federal funds rate, which is this first variable here. The second is the wage share, as observed also in the works of uh, uh, Stefano Di Bucchiani and Antonio Lofaro. Uh, a positive shock in the federal funds rate has a temporary and uh, only for some quarters a statistically significant effect on the wage share and a negative effect, negative persistent and statistically significant effect on uh, autonomous demand, being defined as the sum of private residential investment and consumer credit. 
defects on induced consumption, which is the fourth variable in the first column, are first positive, but as you can see, transitory. It lasts two quarters only, and then it's not statistically significant. Uh, the effect on output is in the beginning positive, driven by obviously the effect of induced consumption and the wage share, and then it becomes negatively and statistic, permanently statistically significant for output, driven obviously by the effect of autonomous demand. Then our second uh, variable of interest is the wage share, so positive shocks in the wage share, which can be observed in the second column here, so the second chart of the second column, lead to uh, uh, non-statistically significant results in autonomous demand, that is, autonomous demand is not influenced by structural shocks in the wage share, and to transitory, very transitory, uh, and after the second quarter, non-statistically significant effects, in induced consumption and output, which is also in line with the, the super multiplier approach. Uh, the third shock, which is a positive shock in autonomous demand, in this case, considering private residential investment and consumer credit aggregated together, we have that a positive shock in this variable leads to permanent uh, and statistically significant effects, both in induced consumption and output, and also on the wage share. And uh, this uh, obviously can be explained by the fact that growth is, uh, uh, drives the, the, the wage share. And as uh, Franklin likes to say, uh, the ones that like the most uh, the growth are the wage earners, not capitalists. So this uh, confirmed this idea. So let's go to the next exercise. Oh, something that I maybe forgot to say is that the gray bands you cannot, say prob you cannot see probably, but there is a, a difference in shades of grays uh, denote the statistically significant uh, confidence bands that are calculated through uh, 1,000 rands moving block uh, bootstraps. So, uh, in this second exercise, what you do, we do uh, is um, separating private residential investment and consumer credit and uh, the results that we get is that uh, a positive shock in the federal funds rate has very important uh, effects in private residential investment uh, and in consumer credit but uh, it's uh, it particularly affects uh, private residential investment which then drives induced consumption and uh, and output the effect of the weight, a positive shock in the weight share is not uh, statistically significant on private residential investment nor on credit finance consumption as in the, the previous model and has only very transitory uh, effects on induced consumption and output as predicted in the super multiplier approach. Uh, then, a shock in private residential investment has persistent and statistically significant effects both uh, in uh, credit finance consumption and induced consumption as well as on output, as we, we would expect. However, this is something that is interesting, whereas uh, private residential investment is driving uh, credit finance consumption, the inverse does not hold true. That is, credit finance consumption is not driving private residential investment uh, and uh, it's not driving induced consumption nor output. So this is uh, uh, also an interesting finding of this, of this work. So uh, if we decide to include uh, uh, or oh, to aggregate private residential investment to durable consumption instead of considering consumer credits, our results uh, don't change that much. That is, a positive shock in the federal funds rate has positive statistically significant negative effects on autonomous demand, uh, on uh, negative effects on induced consumption and on output. The wage share, again, uh, does not affect uh, uh, our, our, aggregate ver uh, our, our aggregated variable for autonomous demand, and it has transitory effects both on induced consumption and output. What does it happen uh, when, we, when we simulate a shock uh, on, on autonomous demand? Again, we get 
persistent positive and statistically significant effects on induced consumption and on output. Uh, lastly, no, our pre-last result uh, is splitting private residential investment and uh, durable consumption good. Uh, again, uh, we can say that uh, the effect of monetary policy, again, is more important on, on private residential investment rather than on durable consumption good, even though uh, there is a negative effect which is uh, uh, persistent and statistically significant also on durable consumption. A positive shock in the wage share has uh, um, not so clear effect both on private residential investment and durable consumption good, and uh, transitory effect on consumption and output. Uh, again, private residential investment is causing uh, durable consumption good, whereas the inverse does not hold true. That is, a positive shock in durable consumption does not uh, uh, lead to a positive movement in private residential investment. So, whereas uh, housing causes durable consumption, durable consumption does not cause housing, housing in the US at least. Lastly, uh, we separate our um, consumer credit variables in two different variables that is, non revolving and revolving loans uh, by Revolving loans, uh, we, we have as uh, main example credit card lo loans, so more uh, immediate uh, uh, need for credit from the, from the household side. And as uh, non-revolving loans, we can, for instance, mention loans for uh, getting a car or uh, renewing the house and so on and so forth. So something that you go to the bank, ask for the amount, and then uh, you get uh, a loan that you pay uh, uh, in the time that the, the bank uh, gives, uh, uh, gives the households. So the, the results are that, uh, uh, again, the most important um, effect of uh, an increasing monetary policy is through the private residential investment channel in the first column. In the second column, uh, a shock in the wage share has n not that clear effects on residential investment nor on revolving loans, but it has uh, clearly a negative and statistically significant effect on non-revolving loans. That is uh, also an interesting finding because it tells that a part of consumer credit in the United States is mainly replacing income, uh, for instance, especially for wage earners in the US. And this is something that has been uh, extensively discussed by Fazari and, uh, uh, and, uh, and many others, especially in the case of the 2008 crisis. Um, so, um, Again, uh, as we have observed in the other estimations, where positive shocks in private residential investment drive uh, either durable consumption good or uh, consumer credit, both of the, of the variables that can be defined as consumer credit in this analysis, that is not revolving and revolving loans, are not particularly causing private residential investment. So, uh, before going to the concluding remarks, I will go to some uh, of our uh, robustness tests. Uh, first, I will show you the results of uh, uh, forecast error variance decompositions, uh, which tells us how much of the variability of each of the considered variables can be explained by structural shocks in each of the variables considered. So, uh, in this figure, we can see that the variability of the wage share in the United States is mainly explained by uh, structural shocks on output, on autonomous demand, and on the interest rate. Uh, moreover, we can see that uh, the variability of our autonomous demand variable is only explained by shocks in itself, that is, it's autonomous, or shocks in monetary policy. That is, it's affected by monetary policy. And this is something that uh, uh, we, we expected. Output, last variable that you see here, the variability of output is explained by 
uh, mostly by itself and by the autonomous demand variable. If uh, we change the order of the variables following uh, the Bucchianico and Lofaro, that is ordering the wage share at last, saying that the wage share is affected obviously by the activity level, uh, we get uh, similar results. That is, the wage share is affected by the level of output, by autonomous demand, and, uh, and by itself. Whereas uh, autonomous demand, uh, ADCC here, so the second uh, figure, is, uh, can be explained by itself and by uh, shocks in the federal funds rate, so that is monetary policy. Mm, so one uh, more robustness uh, uh, check would be uh, changing the order of the variables or during the federal funds rate at last to consider it for a word in which we apply the Taylor rule. Uh, in doing so, our results do not uh, uh, change significantly. That is, monetary policy affects output mainly through the autonomous demand channel. Uh, and uh, uh, positive shocks in the wage share uh, uh, have transitory effects both on output and uh, in induced uh, consumption. Well, uh, now I can go finally to the concluding remarks. I have to move back, yeah. So, uh, in this uh, empirical work uh, in, that I just showed you, uh, we have uh, uh, seen that contractionary monetary policy shocks have negative statistically significant effects on autonomous expenditure and be defined by uh, private residential investment added to consumer credit uh, or added to durable consumption goods and affecting in particularly private residential investment. Uh, moreover, a positive shock in income distribution, that is a positive shock in the wage share, uh, seems to have some negative effects on uh, autonomous consumption, and uh, this is particularly true uh, when we consider durable consumption goods and non revolving loans. This is not the case for private residential investment where results are not clear. Uh, that is, they are in a, a negative relation with autonomous, uh, uh, these considered semi autonomous uh, components of demand. That is, credit is replacing income uh, for American households. Um, a positive shock in overall autonomous consumption be defined as uh, the sum of private uh, residential investment and consumer credit, the sum of private residential investment and durable consumption goods has long lasting and statistically significant effects on consumption output and also on the adjusted wage share. Uh, and finally, a positive shock in private residential investment has positive persistent and statistically significant effects on all the other autonomous demand variables, that is, private residential investment is driving consumer credit, be defined revolving, non revolving loans, or be defined as durable consumption goods, cons confirming the thesis of uh, uh, Lemur 2007 and 15. Whereas the inverse, uh, that is, these components do not cause uh, uh, private residential investment in the US. Uh, this uh, is all my references. I thank you for your attention. I look forward for your comments. Thank you very much, Maria. Very nice presentation. Uh, now, Stephen, it's your turn. <laughs> Hello. Good afternoon. I could say bon dia, but I guess that's too late. <laughs> uh, so it's great to be back here in Rio at the, at the workshop. Um, pandemic intervened after we really got some momentum going. Thanks again to 
Ricardo and, the, and everybody around here who's made this possible. It's been really interesting and it's an honor to be here and it's an honor to talk at this uh, kind of home of the super multiplier in many ways, uh, which has become a big part of my life and my thinking. Uh, so today's talk is about monetary policy. Uh, I've written on fiscal policy. Uh, actually, in the, in the workshop here that was online, we talked about that issue. Um, or maybe it wasn't that. It was the earlier one <laughs> at the FMM conference that uh, I talked about that one. Uh, but this is new uh, and I think important. Uh, in particular, monetary policy, if you want to understand or you want to try to contrast uh, super multiplier models, uh, demand-led growth models more broadly, with uh, more of a mainstream view, it seems to be monetary policy is central. Monetary policy is the deus ex machina, if I can use that term, uh, in the mainstream, the kind of moderate mainstream of how uh, basically demand gets relegated back to the, sh you know, just into the short run. And so I, I think it's really important to talk about this. This, and from my point of view, is, is simple and a first step, and, and we'll see how that plays out. So I'm gonna just start with uh, some pretty obvious points about uh, just comparing two broad paradigms. The, this one first being the neoclassical synthesis, an old term, uh, but I think uh, in some ways more accurate than new consensus because it really is trying to synthesize uh, Keynesian short run with a classical long run. So what I have on the slide is exactly that. Uh, so in the long run, we have the supply determined growth path, the natural rate of growth, which is independent of demand dynamics. Now I should say that there is some, uh, some mainstream work, which is, in a complicated way, very complicated way, uh, trying to maybe say this isn't quite right, it goes through some various technical change, things like that. I must say that when I try to read it, I get through about three pages and my head starts to spin. Uh, when my wonderful graduate student, who I'll be talking about a lot today, Alejandro Gonzalez, when he presents it, he works harder at it, my head starts to spin after about 10 minutes. Uh, it's very, it's, it's, I mean, I won't mince words, it's tortured. Uh, they, 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 are, they are trying to go the right direction. They are trying to get something like secular stagnation, something like the fact that, that a stagnant demand actually does matter in the long run because the evidence is very strong on that in the U.S. However, uh, it's, very, uh, it's very complicated. You will see the exact opposite of that today uh, in, in, as, as I go, for, to go forward. I also want to just comment briefly on the nominal rigidity point. So of course, in all these models, they start off with wages and prices are not fully flexible. Uh, monetary policy would fix everything except for the zero lower bound. Uh, but I, I mean, I've been at this now for over 40 years. One of the first set of researches that, that I uh, engaged in was to explore both the logic and empirical evidence for the idea that, that, that wage and price rigidity was the reason that we get demand effects. And I don't think there's much evidence of that. Actually, I don't even think the mainstream believes it. They write their models that way, but ask a sensible mainstream monetary policy leader if they want deflation when the economy is weak. And uh, you know, Ben Bernanke will say, of course not. We, no way do we want to have this. But if you look at the Abel and Bernanke textbook, it says, why is there, why is there Keynesian effects? Because wages and prices don't fall fast enough. Uh, it, it seems to me a, a massive contradiction. But I shouldn't use my talk here to, to give my, uh, my, my uh, comments on all ma of macroeconomics, so I'll move on. So paradigm two, demand-led growth with accommodating supply. This is the, the, uh, the title of our 2020 paper, which uh, is my favorite of my 40-year career. Um, and, and here the idea is that demand is almost always, the term here, proximate determinant of the output path over all horizons. The exception would be if resource constraints bind, but that's hardly ever true, although we've been through the pandemic, so I'll say a little bit about that later. And of course, the super multiplier models lead to this perspective. Then the addition, particularly of the 2020 paper, uh, is that, and others have done this too, of course, that demand leads supply. Uh, and I put the term hysteresis in, in parentheses, kind of path dependence. It was mentioned earlier in our conversation. There's a little bit of debate now about whether this is truly hysteresis, uh, but what, I don't care. <laughs> uh, what I do care about is, is the idea that the dynamics of demand are what are, are important in driving the supply side of the economy. So reversing the basic logic of the neoclassical synthesis. In this context, there's no supply determined natural path for, for potential output. It's not some kind of uh, res resources uh, driven, uh, technology driven path alone. It really depends on how demand evolves through time. Uh, 
Franklin Ricardo have written an interesting paper, which I'll talk about a bit too here. There's no natural rate of interest. There's no natural rate of unemployment. All these things become endogenous to the dynamics of demand in this paradigm. So demand matters beyond the short run. It's one of my favorite comments. My students hear it all the time in terms of trying to understand the economy that we, that we live in. So in the monetary policy, as I said just in my very brief introductory remarks, in the new consensus, the idea is, well, nominal adjustments should eliminate the demand effects and output in employment, but somehow that's slow in a way that's not ever clearly specified. Uh, so what we're going to do is offset uh, demand shocks with wise monetary policy. I can't help but, uh, but tell a little story here. Oh, it must have been the early 1990s I was presenting an empirical paper uh, that basically criticized the idea that wage and price adjustment was stabilizing. And my discussant was Frederick Mishkin, a name you know. He was, a, I don't know if he was the governor of the Fed at the time, but he would become that prominent monetary economist. And I thought I might get a lot of trouble from him, and I got no trouble at all. He said, of course, Steve is right. Uh, wage and price adjustment is not the way we get back to full employment. We get there because of monetary policy. We offset the man shocks because of monetary policy, which was emerging in that time of period as really this new consensus. This idea of monetary policy is the whole story. Uh, it's all we really need. It's relegated fiscal policy to uh, so-called structural supply side kinds of, uh, kinds of effects. Uh, and until the zero bound became an issue in the United States, uh, the idea was monetary policy would take care of anything we might call remotely Keynesian. And as, as the slide suggests here, you target potential output, you target a, a, a natural rate of interest, which is supposed to uh, exist, a natural rate of unemployment. There is an endogenous money aspect to this, too. We're not talking about uh, targeting the money supply. In the earlier presentation, we did see the old uh, MV equals PY equation. Uh, but monetary policy these days, I think, is, is widely recognized to be setting interest rates. Uh, but, and, and I think I've already said this, it's believed to be effective uh, all the time prior to 2007, 8, 9, uh, at least in the United States. Uh, but, uh, but now there's the, rec the, the recognition of the zero lower bound uh, qualification, although this is viewed as abnormal. It's viewed as, as not the typical situation. I refer here primarily to the kind of numerous blog posts and New York Times columns of, of Paul Krugman, who will recognize this right away. But it's always in normal times, monetary policy will take. Well, it's, it's a sense that normal, normal means monetary policy will take care of any Keynesian issues. And then we have the policy rules, Taylor rule, inflation targeting, these kinds of things. And this is the dominant practical perspective. So in this paper, I want to ask a kind of what if question. And so it's a starting point to, to thinking more deeply about these issues. What if the monetary policy assumes that paradigm one, that neoclassical synthesis, when reality is we're, we're, driven, we're in a demand-led uh, world of paradigm two? And the answer will be resource will be wasted, unemployment will be higher, policymakers will mistake an insufficient demand path for some kind of unidentified negative productivity shock because they'll see a convergence to an unemployment rate that's stable over time if it follows the, uh, the paradigm two model, but is, is, not, is, is not in any sense natural, where that unemployment rate could be quite different if the demand dynamics were different. And uh, this kind of maybe a little bit too provocative term in my title, this is inevitable march to the zero lower bound. Uh, when I kind of envisioned this paper, I thought that's more what it would be. It's not necessarily an inevitable march to the zero lower down. It depends on the policy perspective, as, as I hope I'll be able to show in the next few minutes. But there is a, a, a reason to expect that in some ways, if the, if the monetary authority is, is reasonably prescient and doesn't just kind of follow a, a, very, uh, a very narrow perspective on what, say, a natural rate of unemployment looks like, then there's a very good chance, with, if we have what I, something which I think we had in the US, uh, a, a permanent uh, negative shock in demand growth, that the result will be a, a, a movement towards a zero lower bound. And interestingly, I didn't intend to do this until I was actually simulating some models, but also there's some relevance of this in the supply shock. Um, so the, the issue here is that this zero lower bound is in no sense abnormal, that there are structural situations, and I believe the U.S. has found itself in one, at least pri prior to the pandemic, when the zero lower bound is the likely outcome, possibly inevitable. So uh, I, I want to emphasize the title of this slide, very, very simple model. Now everybody that's presented, to, I think, at this conference has the word simple, and then you see lots of equations. <laughs> 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 
this will be a simple model. We don't have, we don't have the presentation. Sergio, you're coming up. There's tomorrow. I, but I'm going to make a strong bet this will be the simplest model here. And, and I, I, I owe this to Alejandro, uh, who many of you know, and all of you should know, will know soon, because he's, he, you know, it's not quite me. You know, I like to be relevant. I like to say this is the real world. This is the, you know, the, these are the, the key variables that drive, you know, the path of output, the path of demand over time. Uh, I really like the, the previous presentation where we saw some solid empirical work on what really matters. There are lots of things that kind of fit together. But Alejandro says, Steve, you want to make a, you want to make a theoretical point. Do it in the simplest possible way. And he's right, <laughs> that this very simple model will, will generate all the key results. I could make it more complicated. Uh, I could link it more to my earlier work, uh, but it wouldn't really help. And so this will be a very simple model. In that sense, it, it's, a, it's a conceptual model. It's not designed to be empirically implemented. And these, these results uh, easily generalize. Our 2020 paper, that Alejandro and I have this empirical paper, which was also presented at the FMM uh, conference, uh, which estimates a much more extensive version of this model. But all the results that I talk about today would easily generalize to those more realistic models. So, simple model. Here it is. Two components of aggregate demand, consumption and autonomous demand. You say, Fazari, you're up there. No investment, nope, <laughs> no capital. Don't need it here. Uh, consumption, obvious, uh, uh, marginal propensity to consume, or one minus marginal propensity to save. That's a, a mistake in my equation, of course. <laughs> that should be consumption depending on income. And then the not so super multiplier, uh, <laughs> which is without capital, it just becomes, uh, it becomes the you know, Econ 101 version, autonomous demand divided by the saving rate. Um, and so for a given, obviously for a given uh, saving rate, that autonomous demand grows at, uh, at some exogenous rate. Well, well, we'll be shocked, but I won't explain this besides the shock here. A little, you know, a little less Econ 101 is the supply side, which is important here. Normalize the, uh, the labor supply to one. So uh, the unemployment rate plus the employment rate equals one. That's labor supply. Uh, a Leontief production function. Uh, so there's a productivity term. And then the key structural relationship, the third relationship up there, hope you can see it okay, it's a little small, uh, that the, the, the growth of productivity is a function of the unemployment rate. There's an exogenous term, which would be, a, you could think of it as a supply shock, the fee zero, and then there is the, um, uh, the unemployment effect. So this is, uh, I think, in, in terms of motivating this, and this goes back to the 2020 paper, uh, my favorite term is Amatavidat, who says necessity is the mother of invention. That is, when, when the economy is, is, is doing well, the unemployment rate is lower, there will be more incentive to raise productivity. And there, there are a variety of, of different so-called micro-foundations. You could use this, including some of my old work on high cash flow leading to high research and development and things along those lines. But the basic story here is a strong economy sees faster productivity growth. Um, I want to just elaborate a little bit on these supply ca characteristics. I've just repeated the equation here. Uh, just something to, to recognize that's important is that the level of demand, as reflected in the unemployment rate here, affects the productivity growth rate. So there's a dimensionality issue here that's really quite important. And that's a contrast with a typical hysteresis path dependence of Caldor Verdun, where you usually see the growth and gro growth on growth. And it's actually essential to the, theoretically that without that level growth effect, all this falls apart. Uh, in the 2020 paper, we have uh, a growth on growth effect as well. In our estimates uh, with, with Alejandro, uh, we've estimated these models, and the fee one effect that you see here, generalized, it actually is, is extremely strong. So you can talk to me afterwards, and I'll, I'll tell you why I think it's actually almost too strong in terms of our estimates. Uh, we also estimate an effect of the growth of the economy on the growth of productivity, and that turns out to be exceedingly weak. Uh, and you may say, well, how does that tie into the Calder Verdurin literature? Many of those will find strong effects. And I refer you to our, to our empirical working paper on this, because if this structure that you're seeing here is true, somewhat generalized to include some additional effects, then the Calder Verdun coefficient, as usually estimated, can be explained as it's really a combination of these things. And so I think this approach actually helps identify the way that the path dependence and hysteresis works in, in a way that I think is quite helpful. But that's not the main point today. We have this very simple specification. Okay, so very simple steady state. Of course, output growth is determined by the growth rate of autonomous demand instantaneously because of the very simple model. We're in paradigm two. 
the equilibrium unemployment rate is not natural. It depends on demand dynamics. So you see the equation for it up here, that the growth rate of autonomous demand shows up in the equation for the equilibrium unemployment rate. Uh, and the kind of intuition here is the way the supply side and the demand side interact. If there is an expansion in in uh, GZ, if autonomous demand starts to rise, of course the unemployment rate starts to fall, that encourages more productivity to, to, to go faster, and uh, ultimately will lower the long run unemployment rate. The, you can see here the importance though of the phi one parameter showing up in that denominator. This is the kind of key relationship that allows the supply side to accommodate the, the change in the path of the demand side. So uh, if V1 is zero, then, then uh, this all falls apart. However, as I, as I em emphasized, at least with our estimates, V1 is actually very, very strong. Um, I also wanted to, to give the qualification I've been doing now for several years talking about this approach, which is this does not necessarily uh, suggest that uh, that demand can grow in, infinitely fast or at an arbitrarily high level and, and supply will, ne will necessarily come back to it. Because you can see in this equation that uh, eventually you're going to hit some minimum unemployment rate. That is, as GZ rises, other things equal, the unemployment rate falls and, and it can't go below zero. Uh, what you think the minimum is, there's probably some nonlinearities here, but the, the point being there, there can ultimately be capacity constraints on the economy, but they're not in some sense natural. That is the, what, what's happening here is, uh, in terms of the supply side equilibrium, is being driven by the demand side. Okay. So now to the, to the main topic, let me just check time. Doing okay. Um, so uh, how, do, how do I incorporate uh, monetary policy? Well, when I started this off, you know, I had this idea, been reading Maria Cristina's work and others and saying my own view historically of the US, well, I should have housing because that's really the key way that interest rates enter the demand and, and uh, then there's a kind of stock adjustment issue and all sorts of things. I started writing down a lot of equations. Probably Alejandro comes by my office and says, be simple. <laughs> so, so I have this very simple, uh, very, very simple idea. Just let's make the saving rate depend on the interest rate. Uh, so a higher interest rate leads to a higher saving rate and of course will lower the multiplier and affect the output path. Uh, and I do make a, some points in the paper about how this actually can generalize some in the broad sense. You can think about consumption more broadly, for example, is including something like residential construction or things along those lines uh, and, and, and maybe justify this. But that's really not my point here. My point here is to illustrate some basic, basic issues. Uh, so interest, now we make demand interest sensitive. Uh, the interest rate is set by what I'm calling a quasi-Taylor rule with a zero lower bound. So the interest rate is primarily driven by the difference between the unemployment rate and a target rate that is determined by the central bank, but it has to be above zero. Uh, you'd say, well, why not inflation here? Uh, and that's actually an interesting point. Uh, again, to try to be simple, uh, there's a little appendix to the paper that says if you put uh, an inflation term here in a linear Phillips curve, you get just change the parameters effectively is all you would do. I think if you wanted to do more comparison with the mainstream, it might be important to put inflation into the perspective. But for the, for the model I'm presenting, I don't think it's going to make any difference. It's just an issue of parameter values. Um, and then the one, the one little extra thing I added to the simple model was some interest rates moving. And my main reason for that is just to, is to generate nice pictures. Uh, so uh, you know, to avoid kind of choppy little discrete things that happen because of things adjusting too fast. And so uh, that has no great significance here except it'll generate some, some nice pictures. And so the core of the, of the result, I hope you can see this. I, I realize it's kind of small, but, but bigger than yours. <laughs> Uh, so, because uh, the results are here. I mean, these results could all be generated in some sense analytically, but it's, it means it's, it's easier to see them in the context of these, of these charts. So you probably can't see what these things are. They all have the same, the, the titles are going to be too small. It's the unemployment rate on the upper left, uh, uh, output growth on the, on the right, upper right. The middle is the interest rate, the saving rate. Bottom is productivity level and output level. So. And there's, there's going to be uh, two and in some cases three lines on all the charts. The, the blue dotted line is the, is the baseline with no monetary response. And the red lines would have some kind of Taylor rule response to the, uh, uh, to the shock. And so we have a negative demand shock. What do you see? Does this work? 
Can I, yes, that's good. this is good. So a negative demand shock that pushes up the unemployment rate very quickly. And you see the dotted line, it comes back down. It's, this is temporary, a temporary shock. It, it does, it, it's, it's up and then it decays relatively quickly over a few quarters. Uh, and, and, and what happens, uh, so this is the baseline. If the baseline, the interest rate would not change, the saving rate would not change. Uh, but with monetary policy response, you get, um, you do get an interest rate response to the higher unemployment rate. There's a little bit of overshooting. I don't think that's important here. The saving rate will fall a bit, uh, initially because of the interest rate. Oops, this is not good <laughs> if I use that approach. Um, so, um, so you do get some stabilization. I might try to use the pointer. Does it work? Center, thank you. There we go. This is probably better. So, uh, so you get some, some response here. You don't see it much. You'll see it more in some other uh, pictures that uh, might be a little bit more if you see it in the output. You see the output comes up, comes back a bit faster, but it comes back to the same level. Everything, everything is going to stabilize. This, this is perfectly straightforward. I, you know, the demand path has not changed permanently. Demand, this is demand-led growth model. So if you don't change the demand path, nothing is going to happen in the long run. Uh, so there's some uh, parameters don't matter here uh, I, in, in the sense I don't think all these results would be robust to any parameter choices you like. Uh, so I won't really try to comment on the, on the magnitude of the stabilization. But there's some stabilization when you have a negative demand shock of you cutting interest rates if demand is interest sensitive. Uh, so that is that, the simplest case. Much more interesting here, a permanent shock in the level of demand, and, I, and I'll be doing that later. So, so now it looks, the unemployment rate looks similar, and that's important because we haven't changed the growth rate. Remember that equation back a few slides ago. The unemployment rate depends on the growth rate of demand. That has not changed. It's a one, it's a one off level change, but that level change is permanent. Permanent in the trend, in the sense of it's a percentage drop in demand, but with the growth rate staying constant in the long run. So the unemployment rate is going to come back to the same level, uh, and uh, you see the growth, and the growth rate is going to come back to the same level as you see here in this upper corner. Uh, again, the interest rate will fall. Now you get a bigger interest rate response because there's a bigger effect on demand. A saving rate falls, but now look at productivity and output. So, so the output level is going to go down. And again, this is incredibly simple. There's not any real adjustment dynamics here on the output side. So our output would immediately fall because demand is lower in percentage terms. And in the absence of monetary policy, would stay, would stay at the lower level. Uh, but then there's this little bit of a kick from the interest rate adjustment of the red line that you see along these lines. But nothing on the unemployment rate. Well, why doesn't monetary policy keep cutting interest rates? The zero lower bound here does not bind. You can't see the scale, but it does not bind. Well, because they say that, why should we? <laughs> you know, the Taylor rule looks at this and says, the unemployment rate is back to where we thought it should be. <laughs> OK, output's lower. If you, uh, I can't remember names. I'm, I'm sorry, but someone earlier presented the CBO forecast for the US and the actual path. <laughs> and there's this dramatic difference. But the unemployment rate's low. Why should I cut the interest rate anymore? <laughs> Uh, what they miss is, is this, that you've lost the productivity, and that productivity loss is, is endogenous. So the, the big distinction, and this really is kind of in some ways the, the message of the paper, is that when you have this path dependence, also known as hysteresis, that, uh, but you don't believe it, I mean, you don't, you don't understand that, you, 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 view, you view the world through the neoclassical synthesis lens, then uh, you'll say, well, there must have been a negative productivity shock. Uh, look at that. Yeah, too bad. <laughs> Nothing we can do about it. But there's no sense in, the, in, in which that's true. I mean, the result here is a negative, by, by construction, is a negative demand shock, a permanent negative demand shock. So did I say everything? Yeah, the conventional view is that monetary policy was effective. We did what we should. <laughs> you know, we helped a little bit. Uh, we did what we should. Uh, and there's no zero lower bound here. Uh, I mean, it could be. If the shock was big enough, it might bind. But uh, uh, it, it certainly doesn't need to. Okay, I have to move along a little bit. So here's maybe the, the, the inevitable March picture. So this is the negative demand growth shock uh, that takes place. And so here things are, 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 more, are more interesting, more complicated. So you see that, in fact, the unemployment rate does rise in equilibrium uh, because now basically it's, it's equating supply and demand, uh, that uh, productivity is going to grow more slowly. And, and this is, uh, I won't go into the details here in the issue of time. Uh, sure enough. The, the monetary policy cuts the interest rate. 
But you see it converges to a low level. So this is something I, I have to say it wasn't immediately obvious to me. But what, what's happening is that the gap between the unemployment rate and uh, the actual unemployment rate and the initial target stabilizes because the unemployment rate goes up. In, in this case, it goes from 4% to 5%. And, and so that gap stabilizes. So this typical Taylor rule that drives interest rates by the gap, will, there's no longer a, 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 a reason to cut the interest rate because the gap is the same. So now there's really, I think, two kind of ways that you can think of monetary policy adjusting. This is, and this picture is the first one, which is you accept this as a new normal. So you basically say, look, we've had unemployment at this higher level for a long time, and uh, this must be, because we view this through the conventional lens, this must be the new natural rate. So we just sit there. And yes, actually, interest rates are lower. There's no sign of inflation. You might leave them there, but there's no reason to cut them further. I, at first, I thought this might be the kind of appropriate or the most likely case. I'm not so sure about that. I'll give you the second case on the next slide. You notice here, though, what happens with the slower demand growth that both output and uh, productivity in percentage terms are going to fall persistently uh, uh, relative to the initial path uh, in, in, that, in that sense. And you can see the effect of the monetary policy. By having a lower interest rate, that's going to you know, change that saving rate a little bit. The not-so-super not multiplier is going to be a little bit bigger than it otherwise would be. And so, but, but the growth is, is going to be persistently persistently lower, and again, a claim of a negative productivity shock, even though that productivity shock is, is completely, um, completely endogenous. So this is an alternative monetary policy, and actually, in some sense, it probably is more realistic for the US uh, after the Great Recession. So the idea here is, you know, you see this converging, but, but you know it's not right. Inflation is low, you're way below trend, uh, and, and so you're going to, tr what, what are you going to do? You say, even though the, the gap between the unemployment rate has converged, if I follow the, the simple-minded Taylor rule, I have some, you know, discretionary sense that demand is still weak. So then you get this inevitable march to the zero lower bound. That's the green line here. This is zero. You know, you'll keep cutting the interest rate because you say we could, really should be able to, to grow the economy faster. Uh, you see the growth rate has fallen here. Uh, and try to push that growth rate back up, but then you hit the zero bound and, 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 you, come, and you come back down to the growth rate of autonomous demand. Uh, so the key thing, why, why does monetary policy not work? Why do you have an in inevitable march to the zero lower bound? Because the level, the level of demand depends on the level of the interest rate. So if you want to have demand grow faster, you have to cut the interest rate. Uh, you can do that for a while, but eventually you run out of, you run out of room. You hit the zero lower bound. So it's you know, that dimensionality, which is really, which is really critical. Uh, and so here, with that alternative policy, you get, at least in quantitative terms with my simulations, uh, you know, so, not trivially higher output level, but again, the, you know, in percentage terms or log terms, if you like, you're going to get this persistent, uh, persistent uh, growth that's below, you know, below what, what you had before, again, entirely driven by demand. And, the, and it pulls the supply side along with it. The mainstream says, negative productivity growth shock. That would be the, the natural interpretation here uh, as you move forward. Uh, okay, didn't really intend to do much with this, but since it was in the model and uh, since I have, uh, according to my estimates, uh, seven minutes, I will, uh, uh, I, I'll talk a little bit about supply shocks. Actually, you know what? I'm not gonna talk about supply shocks. The last part's more interesting. Supply shocks are in the paper. You can talk to me about it later. So let me just, again, I can't help but being a bit empirical. <laughs> In a, in a way. So how does this, how does this story you know, link into to, to US experience? So this slide is, I call it documenting the march, documenting the march to the zero lower bound. The green line, I think we saw a good part of the, a longer time series of this earlier, is the US federal funds rate uh, going back to the late 1970s. Uh, obviously a long downward trend. Uh, you could uh, maybe make an argument it should be the real interest rate, not the nominal rate, which would change a lot in the beginning. But once you get into the 1990s, you'd still see the downward trend. Finally, we hit the zero bound uh, you know, twice, a long time after the Great Recession, and then in the initial phases after the pandemic. What about the, the, the top line is kind of an unusual one, so let me explain it. Uh, it's, the, it's the percentage, it's an index. You see the index over there on the right side. Um, an index of... Uh, GDP, U.S. GDP uh, with uh, 1990 and 2007 being 100. And I, I picked them because they're roughly peaks of the business cycle. And so the idea here is that 
this, this, is, this is a kind of deviation from the long run trend uh, of, uh, of output. And, and uh, so, you, you know, what, what do you see here? This is, uh, let me get it right, this is 100 right here. I, It's, the, it's a percentage deviation from the long-run trend of U.S. GDP between 1990 and 2007. So I've, this is 1990, this is 2007, these are 100. Okay, we had a recession in 90, there was the Clinton boom, here's the tech bubble bursting, bit of a recovery, <laughs> bang, great recession. You know, never comes back, right? I mean, this is a... This is the situation, again, uh, there was another probably more transparent picture earlier about the projections of the CBO uh, and, and the actual. So you, you know, you've got this persistently negative or persistently uh, low level uh, of, demand, uh, of demand growth at this point. And is it tied to autonomous demand? <laughs> this is a little more straightforward. So this, the white line is the, um, is autonomous demand, as Alejandro and I measure it in our empirical work. It's uh, uh, government spending, including certain social services, I can explain this more, especially government medical payments. Those are autonomous demand, even though they're not government spent in the U.S. accounts. When the government pays, uh, pays my parents' medical bills, uh, and soon mine, uh, they, uh, you know, that's treated as personal consumption, but it's, it, it's clearly autonomous demand. Uh, it also includes Social Security, which is a little bit more the retirement uh, fund for the U.S., a little more ambiguous because it need not be consumed, but considering the distribution of it, it's probably quite likely. And it includes residential investment and it includes exports. I don't have consumer credit here. That's another story. So most of this is government. If you looked at the government, the dynamics would look a little bit different. It's really, it's really stunning. Uh, the way that the autonomous demand. This is the this the trend is 2000 to 2007. That's the it's you know just it's not even a, a regression. It's just you know plunking the the growth rates there and then and putting them. But you'd see it fits. It could be a regression. It wouldn't change anything. If you if you took it back to the 1990s, you have almost the same trend. Uh, so this is you know things are kind of moving along during this great moderation period. This was no great booming recovery, but we had we needed this is my story in some ways. We needed that autonomous demand. We needed that demand. A lot of it was residential construction growth that was taking place during that period of time, and uh, you know we we had to have it uh, to keep the economy even kind of sort of full employment. It wasn't again it was not a particularly strong boom. Uh, this was called the jobless recovery in here, uh, but. After the Great Recession, there has been this persistent drop. Now, this ends in 2019. That's when our data series ends. Uh, undoubtedly, the stimulus that we've talked about some in the previous sessions would show a big spike upward, but it's coming back down again. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, a good question here would be things about the, um, um, the uh, what's it called? The various uh, Biden, uh, Biden uh, things, the Infrastructure Act, the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, which had nothing, next to nothing to do with inflation. Uh, that uh, it, it, might, it might have changed the story here, so that's worth taking place. But the, the point here is that sense of stagnation and the sense that monetary policy is not doing the job. That uh, this was a time when they were doing, I mean, they, they did hit the zero bound. You know, we did have that inevitable march to the zero lower bound during this period of time. Uh, so I believe, uh, well, this is a little bit about the aftermath of the pandemic. I want to be respect time, so I'll, I'll skip that, but we can talk later if people are interested. So this is my concluding slide. Uh, conventional monetary policy and demand-led growth. So the new consensus is clearly tied to the idea that the long-run potential output is independent of demand dynamics. Uh, and this policy regime is just not going to be effective if growth is going to be led by demand beyond the short run. That it, it leads to these mistaken interpretations that you see these you know, movements in what you would think of as supply-side variables, what the mainstream would interpret as the NIRU or the natural rate of unemployment that looks as if, okay, this is a productivity issue, it must be because that's the only way I'm allowed to understand this, uh, uh, you know, th this, this, um, this kind of result. Uh, and it, it, it leads to uh, basically monetary policy in a, in a sense just not understanding what's actually happening in the economy. If we do have this situation of stagnant demand, and even if the Federal Reserve or the monetary authority it recognizes the, uh, the, the problem as, as one of weak demand, uh, they'll, they'll run into this fundamental problem that you can have weak demand growth about which in the long run they cannot, they cannot fix unless they can let the interest rate fall indefinitely. And so the zero lower bound becomes almost necessary in this sense. 
Uh, you know, there is a possibly stabilizing role for conventional policy, but I'll have to say I'm a bit of skeptic about that. I mean, there's a, a be interesting to, to link this into the, to the empirical work we just saw presented. Uh, but the interest elasticity of demand, I, I broadly believe, is low except for residential investment. And residential investment is an important driver of the cycle. But it, overall, it's a relatively small share of output. Even at its peak, it was about 6 or 7% of US GDP. And it's been much lower since the Great Recession. Uh, you get these massive swings in interest rates. So the new consensus has generated this idea, monetary policy will take care of us. If you look at that you know, federal funds chart, you're going to see 500 basis point changes in interest rates happening regularly. Even in the 2000 recession, 2001 recession, it was a very, hardly even a recession in terms of GDP after the tech bubble burst because in some ways of the housing you know, stimulus still, still powering through that. But they still cut interest rates from 5.25% to 1%. And then it, go, it goes from roughly the same to zero in the Great Recession. In the pa pandemic, they had started raising interest rates and they reversed it, and you could drop again. It, it, it's taking these massive swings in interest rates, and now, of course, raising them up 500 some basis points. Maybe somebody on their phone can tell me if they put another, another quarter. Another quarter, five and a quarter. Okay, we're back to a, a you know a recent, fairly recent peak in some respects. So, uh, you know that you have these massive swings in rates uh, that supposedly are stabilizing the economy, but uh, well, you know there here we are. I mean, there's this. It, it it just it just didn't work. Now you know again the mainstream can say zero lower bound, but here they were actually raising interest rates. Here you know they kind of gave up, right? I mean they. It was a zero lower bound for seven years. So, well, that can't be right. <laughs> Let's start raising interest rates. There was no reason uh, in, in that sense at that, at that point. And they, and they actually, I'm, now I'm getting off track here, but they, they, they relented. Uh, and that was before the pandemic, uh, that they actually started cutting again uh, because the economy was just not doing that great. So, uh, so, you know, this reduces the institutional credibility. Uh, of the process in many ways. And, you know, I hear, uh, I have read large parts of Mark Lavoie's book, so uh, here's the case for the, for the Smithen rule or the Kansas City rule or the Passanetti monetary guidance in some respects about maybe an alternative way of thinking about monetary policy, as well as better directed fiscal policy, of course, because monetary policy can't do the job. Uh, let me stop here. I think I'm just about on time. And uh, I thank you for your attention and look forward to any other discussion. Thank you, Steve. Very good timing. Uh, so let's move to the third presentation by Sergio. Of course, I thank you to have invited uh, me to your fourth workshop on demand-led growth. And uh, uh, the aim of my talk uh, uh, will be to present uh, in a still preliminary stage, an extension to open economy of the critical and reconstructive analysis of the Taylor Rule that I had advanced in a paper of uh, 2023 published in the Review of Political Economy and uh, of which there was just something in a paper published in 2013. And specifically, uh, in the critical part, I will add a discussion of the Taylor Rule with the exchange rate among its argument, and in the reconstructive part uh, that try to rationalize the tendency of central bank to react to price inflation when following a classical approach, I will add some remarks about the effects of changes in the terms of trade on conflict inflation and income distribution. And uh, so, in my presentation, I will start with a brief description of the limits of the activist approach to the Taylor Rule, in a sense, something that uh, uh, Fazzari still said in, at the end of uh, his presentation. And I will pass then to criticize the concept of an equilibrium or natural exchange rate, which is implicit in the traditional extension of the Taylor Rule to open economies. And finally, I present a rationalization of the rule along classical lines where it is interpreted as it is in actual facts as a flexible and not mechanical benchmark for monetary uh, policies. Uh, I don't enter now in the structure of the new Keynesian models where we usually find in the real side of the model 
an IS curve, a Phillips curve, and the Fisher equation, and in the side part of the model, a loss function for the central bank, a monetary policy rule, and a reaction function of a central bank. We can only remind that on the basis of the loss function of the central bank and the lack structure of the model, a definite reaction function is derived, one of which is precisely the Taylor rule that in its original form, as advanced by Taylor in 1993, uh, only needs to know the current rate of inflation and the output gap as measured by the deviation of gross domestic product from its trend, having taken a targeted inflation rate, pigric start, as equal to 2%, and having put the natural rate of interest equal again to 2%, namely equal to the average real interest rate observable in the United States over a long time. Looking at the rule, we see that it is fundamentally composed by two elements. The first one is the targeted inflation rate, and the second one is a definite mechanism to lean against the wind. As regards the targeted inflation rate, it is usually set at a low level under the belief inherited from Friedman that a low and stable inflation rate is the best one to favor relative price adjustments and avoid urgent mistakes and economic instability. And this explains what has been called the inflation hysteria, often prevailing at the level of central bank with its negative effect on the growth rate of the economy. As regards the definite adjustment mechanism, the 1993 Taylor rule embodies what has been called the Taylor principle, namely the increase in the nominal rate of interest that is greater than the increase in the inflation rate. And this is an essential element of the rule because a value greater than one of the slope coefficient on inflation is what you need to avoid hyperinflation and hyperdeflation in the presence of an accelerationist Phillips curve, ensuring that the rule will be an anchor to bring back the inflation rate to its target level. Because according to the IS curve that is present, Ah, okay. I am sorry. So. It seems it works now. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and so I start again. So, in this Taylor, is okay? No, 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 I don't start, I, I continue the presentation. I don't start again, of course. Uh, I start again the presentation, not. <laughs> no. uh, and so, because, uh, of course, in this model, you have an IS curve according to which a higher real interest rate is what you need to bring about a fall in the level of output and therefore in the inflation rate. And this fundamental elements are present in all the uh, different specification of the Taylor rule traceable in the literature as shown in table one, specifically those that take into account that the output gap and the natural interest rate are unknown and must be estimated, that the natural or benchmark real rate of interest may change over time as explicit, for instance, in the Taylor rule advanced by Laubach and uh, Williams, that <clears throat> central bank tend to smooth the changes in the rate of interest due to the uncertainty over the true values of the unobservable variable which are present in the rule, the structure of the economy, and the lags in the effects of monetary policies. And this is taken into consideration, for instance, in the rule advanced by Rudenbosch and Svensson. And the different result that you can have <clears throat> following these uh, uh, these uh, 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 different rules are, for instance, uh, recognized by Yellen when he said that uh, these uh, uh, um, 
uh, set a difficulty for the monetary uh, policy because uh, the impl policy implication of this different uh, rule can differ significantly depending on the particular uh, specification. But of course, the most serious drawback in the Taylor rule is its reference, we can say, to an observable natural interest rate that must be estimated and is affected solely by real factors, such as productivity growth, the growth of workforce, the time preference of households, and the movements in government expenditure. And a first problem which immediately arises in this respect for the monetary authorities is that the counterfactual nature of the benchmark interest lay, uh, rate leads to a variety of estimates, methods, and results that recall the early criticism by Mirdal and Lindahl that Vixel natural rate is not an operational notion in the sense that it is incapable of practical uh, application. And the problem that can be <coughs> can arise in this respect, uh, can be grasped looking at this uh, graph where you have uh, the estimation of the natural interest rate according to the methods advanced by Curdia uh, based of a fully fledged equilibrium model and according to this estimate, the natural rate of interest would have been in the United States negative between the 2007 and 2017 Whereas, according to the semi-structural econometric model of Laubach and Williams, uh, this natural rate of interest tended only to zero in the same period. And so, of course, this gives completely different <laughs> uh, uh, indication to the, mon uh, to the monetary uh, uh, authorities. But a second problem that is, I think, most uh, important is that uh, these estimates are indeed associated to different notions of the natural rate uh, of interest based on the hypothesis made according to the degree of market imperfection and the time span that is considered. So the natural rates that we find in the new Keynesian models range from Vixel's long run efficient natural rate, that is the equilibrium rate that would occur on average in condition of perfect competition to the short run rate which would prevail when the effects of monetary, uh, uh, of temporary shocks are not averaged out and the output is at a level at which inflation does not accelerate when market imperfe imperfection are taken into consideration. And in this case, central bank have the additional problem of defining and measuring these imperfections in the labor, credit, and good uh, uh, markets. And to give an example of the, I lost the graph, uh, of the problems arising from these different notions of the natural rate of interest that Robertson several decades ago distinguished in the natural and quasi-natural rates of, uh, of interest, consider, for instance, a permanent shift of the IS curve from IS1 to IS2. If the monetary authorities don't change the interest rate, of course, output will fall to Y1 below its potential level YP. But if at this point a temporary shift of the IS curve on the left, of course, due to an increase in the propensity to save and a decrease of firm willingness to invest during the crisis, the settlement of the rate of interest to the new normal rate, IN2, will not assure output that comes back to its potential level. The benchmark rate of the monetary authorities should indeed be the quasi-natural rate of interest, I. QN1 and IQN2 that we find by the intersection of the, inter the temporary IS curve due to temporary shocks with the vertical line of the potential uh, uh, output. And of course, uh, having in mind the experience of the 2007 crisis and the estimates advanced by Curdia, I have set this uh, quasi-natural interest rate at negative, also at a, a negative uh, 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 level. However, if these uh, 
variety of estimates and notions of the natural interest rate complicates the specification of the Taylor rule, the traditional interpretation and implementation according to the modern theory of central banking are questioned most of all by the fact that the course of the output gap and prices can differ from the one expected with the new Keynesian models, where, as said, an increase in the interest rate should lead to a fall in aggregate demand, allowing monetary policy to lean against the wind. Well, this view on monetary policy has been questioned on both empirical and theoretical grounds. And a fundamental criticism concerns, of course, the existence itself of a natural rate of interest, which is determined by productivity and thrift, and is independent of monetary uh, factors. And this is the criticism advanced by Keynes in his general theory, arguing that saving equalizes investment by means of income changes, and that the rate of interest is a monetary phenomenon to which capital profitability will uh, uh, adjust. As is well known, especially here with this audience, this criticism of the traditional theory has been reinforced by the capital debate of the 1960s. In fact, the dependence of the value of the capital endowment on relative prices and thus on the rate of interest makes it impossible to take the supply of capital as a single magnitude as given when determining relative prices, which entails that potential output, and therefore the amount of full employment savings, cannot be precisely defined like the full employment marginal product of labor, which requires a given amount of capital to be calculated. Moreover, as the capital controversy has shown, a decreasing supply curve of firm bonds with regard to the interest rate cannot be obtained due to the phenomenon of reswitching and reverse capital deepening. And indeed, in the full employment saving investment market, there may be multiple equilibria, a capital labor ratio that in equilibrium is not necessarily higher for a lower interest rate, and changes in the rate of interest out of the equilibrium that are so strong that they question the validity of the, the of the theory. And of course, this undermines the foundations of the idea of the natural rate of interest determined by productivity and thrift to be found by the monetary policy, and it also questions the neoclassical mechanism guaranteeing the tendency of actual to potential output, which is based on the inverse relation between the rate of interest and the amount of investment. And what is important to stress is that this criticism applies also to the more recent macroeconomic models where the traditional idea of capital as a single magnitude uh, is indeed still present. For instance, this idea of capital as a single magnitude can be shown to be present also in the models advanced by Woodford and other new Keynesian models. And it is also important to stress that multiple equilibria by itself would undermine the idea of the natural interest rate as a benchmark rate for monetary policy. Because central bank would in this case not only be uncertain over its estimates, even if they knew the possible equilibria, they would also have to select the one the policy interest rate should be moved towards based on subjective ordering of this equilibrium. If we now pass to more empirical grounds, the view of the Taylor rule to lean against the wind by changing the policy interest rate in order to stabilize price inflation is challenged by several factors. First, because this would be a rule that must act in the short run, leaning against the wind, although central bank can shape on average market expectations, in the short run, changes in the short-term interest rate may not be followed by changes in the same direction of in the long-term interest rates. Second, a low and asymmetric elasticity of aggregate demand to the interest rate has been pointed out several times especially with regard to consumption and investment, for instance, also 
thanks to the work of uh, Fazzari, and also in the estimates of the IES curve that several times do not find a negative elasticity of output to the real interest rate unless other variables are introduced into the regressive equation such as exchange rate and property prices. This, of course, does not mean that monetary policy doesn't have an effect on output, but suggests that this effect varies according to circumstances and passes through channels which are less mechanical than those based on substitution mechanisms shaping the neoclassical demand for and supply of savings. For instance, uh, due to the effects that the change in the interest rate can have on income distribution, the exchange rate, and therefore the net export, the cost of public debt, service, and credit condition for durable consumption and residential investment. Finally, always on an empirical ground, the same relationship between the interest rate and the price level that we have in the new Keynesian model have been uh, questioning when considering the Gibson paradox and its modern version of the price puzzle that show that when you have a change of the interest rate on impact, and it is important this term, on impact, you have a movement of the, lev the level of price in the same direction which suggests that you have a cost channel monetary policy that can overwhelm its demand channel so that if the monetary authorities face an increase in price inflation by increasing the interest rate as prescribed by the Taylor rule, they can de de determine again on impact a higher and not a lower inflation rate, which also implies that if after a fall in the interest rate, we observe a fall in prices or on impact a lower inflation rate, this doesn't afford any indication, as said several times in the new Keynesian model, any indication that the natural rate of interest should be lower, as stated in this uh, model. But looking at the equation of the new Keynesian models, and specifically to their Phillips curve, the idea that a positive output gap can have persistent and accelerating effects of inflation in the absence of a reaction by central bank may also be questioned, as already said yesterday by Praga in her intervention. In the new Keynesian model, demand pool inflation will accelerate in the absence of a reaction by central banks because it is assumed that expected inflation is fully passed on actual price changes. And as stressed by Serrano, if this hypothesis is removed, a long run or permanent trade-off between inflation and the unemployment rate occurs as in the old version of the Phillips curve. That is to say, before Friedman's introduction of the notion of an unemployment rate with which inflation doesn't accelerate. And this means that we will have different neutral interest rate with which inflation doesn't accelerate, and policymakers have the possibility of choosing the desired pair of inflation and output gap. That is, we have a sort of an old Phillips curve. And of course, we can also say that in the absence of cost push inflation, this trade-off between output and inflation would also tend to disappear, since potential output tends to adjust to the course of actual output, as implied by the tendency of firms to achieve a normal degree of capacity utilization through changes in business investment. And this suggests that there is no exogenously given unique stable equilibrium and that any monetary rate of interest, in a sense, that persists may become a natural rate of interest in a Vexillian sense, that is a rate that guarantees stable prices, again, unless introducing, as we will see, 
cost, inflation. But so far we have criticized the Taylor rule without any reference to the exchange rate because, also because usually this variable is not introduced among the arguments of the rule, probably having in mind the experience of the United States, the Eurozone, and other major advanced countries. There are, however, some Taylor rules where the exchange rate is introduced, one of which is the one advanced by Taylor himself in 1999 under the hypothesis of a zero inflation targeting and therefore without a constant term, where the variables are expressed as a deviation from their long run steady state values and it is assumed that the parameter of reaction GE0 in the expression that I am showing you is negative, namely that the central bank must decrease the rate of interest after an appreciation of the exchange rate. Being in terms of deviation from the long run steady state values, in this formulation an equilibrium exchange rate is implicit and it is assumed that changes in the real exchange rate with respect to this natural or equilibrium exchange rate are driven as in Vixel by the discrepancies between the market and the natural interest rate according to the purchasing power parity condition and the interest parity condition. And because a market interest rate which is lower than the natural one determines higher prices and therefore a depreciation of the exchange rate, as in the Precognition theory of the balance of payment, the adjustment to the equilibrium requires a rise in the interest rate towards its natural level, which is what is prescribed by the rule. That in turn, in a sense, presupposes a policy mix of an open economy, an independent monetary policy which avoids potential fiscal dominance, and a flexible exchange rate. It is worth noting that Taylor himself is skeptical about the use of this rule with the exchange rate, arguing that in a multi-country model with possible reaction of other countries, it could lead to a higher volatility of output and inflation. And moreover, Taylor himself acknowledge the practical difficulty of using such policy rule that stem from the fact that, now I'm quoting him, the long-run equilibrium real interest rate and the long-run equilibrium exchange rate are not known in practice. But again, more fundamentally, we can say that the limits of this Taylor rule with the exchange rate are the same as those of the Taylor rule without the exchange rate because the criticism to the natural interest rate that we have provided is also a criticism to the notion of an equilibrium or optimum exchange rate. Adding that the criticism to any definite mechanism of adjustment of the economy to the full employment equilibrium is in this case reinforced when considering possible changes in the expected exchange rate and the fact that, for instance, the negative effects of the real wages of a currency depreciation cannot be compensated by an improvement in the trade balance if you have a low or null import substitution elasticity and low price elasticity of export. Indeed, following Keynes, as the interest rate is a conventional phenomenon, we can think of a conventional exchange rate also because on the basis of the compensation principle, which extend money endogeneity to open economies, we can argue that it is possible to simultaneously maintain a fixed exchange rate and determine the domestic interest rates, at least within certain limits. But if the traditional interpretation of the Taylor rule doesn't hold, how can we rationalize, in a sense, the tendency of central bank to react to price inflation, defending lenders against inflation and strengthening the international position of the domestic financial 
sector. Well, an alternative interpretation can be provided by combining the idea of the monetary nature of the rate of interest with the idea of a rate of unemployment that is needed to reconcile the conflicting claims of workers and capitalists on income distribution. And there are some key elements behind this alternative interpretation and some steps to be followed to provide it. The key elements are first that the benchmark or targeted real rate of interest of the central bank has to be recognized as a policy determined variable, which is only masqueraded in a sense, as said once by Satterfield, by the central bankers as an objective feature of the economy. Moreover, the wage rate must be above the subsistence level because if not, an inflation barrier will be set up for a given technique adjusting the real interest rate to the, to the value that is socially viable with the maximum rate of profit. Third, at least on average, central bank must be able to affect both the short-term and long-term interest rates by means of their bank system refinancing and open market operations. And finally, as in several words on conflict distribution, of course, the rate of employment must be recognized as one of the element influencing workers' claim in wage bargaining. And so, look at equation 1b. Let us assume in this regard that the targeted wage rate by the workers is negatively influenced by the unemployment rate, and that, on the contrary, it is higher when labor productivity is higher, and when the workers' degree of organization, proxied, for instance, by the trained union membership is higher. Moreover, for the sake of simplicity, let us assume a uniform nominal markup determined by the nominal rate of interest on long-term risk-length bonds high and the normal profits of enterprise NP that, according to Smith and Ricardo, remunerate the risk and trouble to make a productive investment. And always for the sake of simplicity, consider the markup pricing so that prices are uh, determined as the, on the basis of the nominal markup me and the unit labor uh, cost. Well, the first step towards an alternative interpretation of the rule is to consider the effects of wage bargaining on the real interest rate. Uh, a one-off increase in money wages could bring about an increase in real wages since prices initially adjust to the historical cost of capital and the real interest rate, that is the opportunity cost of any capital investment invested in production, will happen to be lower than the initial given nominal interest rate. And this increase, it could be shown, this increase, will be higher, uh, uh, the lower is uh, the uh, wage share uh, in the gross product that you have at the beginning before the rise in the money uh, uh, wages. But we have no time to enter into these uh, technicalities. However, this increase in real wages is temporary in nature if there is only a una tantum increase in money wages because input prices will eventually adjust to their reproduction values. And so a permanent change in the real wage may occur uh, only if workers obtain a continuous increase in their money wages, provided that the monetary authorities leave the nominal interest rate on long-term riskless financial asset at change. And this increase in real wages, namely the fall in the prices to money wage ratio, will not occur only if the monetary authorities increase the nominal rate of interest in order to maintain a targeted real interest rate, IRT, namely if they set the nominal rate of interest I start according to the relation 1 plus I start equal to 1 plus 
IRT times one plus gamma, where gamma is the rate of change of the money uh, wages. As said before, the second step towards an alternative interpretation of the Taylor rule is to introduce an aspiration gap between the central bank's goals and workers' claims, uh, which is what fuels, as we will see, in a wage price spiral. And so let us assume that workers and their organization react to the rise in the nominal rate of interest, which has kept the real interest rate at a given targeted real interest rate by the central bank by asking for an increase in money wages greater than gamma in order to achieve a targeted real, in, uh, targeted real wage rate, which is greater than the real wage that corresponds to the real interest rate aimed at by the central bank. And so now the we will have a rate, a growth rate of money wages, which is higher than gamma. It will be phi according to the discrepancy between the actual and the targeted workers' real wage. But let us suppose that after this stronger increase in money wages, the central bank again in turn reacts by setting the nominal interest rate in order to uh, keep unchanged the real targeted interest rate. Of course, under this condition, there will be increasing inflation. Uh, in, figure show, in figure two, I show the line WWC of the real wage rates claimed by workers for different unemployment rates and the line CBW of the real wage corresponding to the real interest rate targeted by the central bank. The intersection between these two curves gives a value of the unemployment rate that may be labeled as a non-accelerated inflation unemployment rate and this rate is higher, the higher is the real interest rate targeted by central bank or the higher the real wage claimed by workers in wage bargaining for a given unemployment rate due to other social and institutional uh, factors that increase their uh, strength in wage bargaining. On the contrary, this non-accelerated inflation unemployment rate will be lower if you have an increase in labor productivity or in improvements in the terms uh, of trade. If now we consider that taking labor productivity as given, absolute prices might change for a change in the nominal wage rate and the nominal markup, namely, and that the rate of change of money wages is determined by the inflation rate of the previous period and by the difference between the non-accelerated unemployment rate and the actual one, because the lower is the unemployment rate, the greater is the worker's aspiration gap, we get a Phillips curve, according to which when the unemployment rate is lower than the natural unemployment rate, an accelerating inflation will occur, driven by the continuous increase in the nominal interest rate and the consequent growing wage demands by workers. And this accelerating inflation will only stop if the rate of unemployment rises or the central bank lowers its targeted real interest rate or if uh, there is a shift on the left of the curve WWC, see for instance the red line, namely if workers, the shift in the red line if workers accept lowering their claims on income uh, distribution. And we can say that monetary authorities can be pushed to change their targeted real interest rate due, for instance, to a given inflation target, the effect of increasing inflation on real savings, 
fixed incomes and the external constraint, and the fact that this non-accelerating unemployment, inflation unemployment rate can be higher than the maximum socially tolerable, toler tolerable unemployment rate. And for their part, the workers and their organization may reduce the targeted real wage rate due to negative effects of price in inflation on the real earnings of the less organized workers and other sectors of uh, uh, society. And because the implementation of restrictive fiscal and monetary policies uh, can increase the real the rate of uh, unemployment and affect the workers' degree of organization, and also the social political context, determining in this case a shift in the WWC curve. It is also worth noting that the average real wage will be influenced by, in actual facts, by the reaction function of workers and central banks, namely by the speed with which wage bargaining adjusts nominal wages and central banks change the nominal rate of interest. And it will also be influenced by the speed with which firms pass the increase in the nominal markup due to the increase in the interest rate onto prices. And these last remarks are important because they suggest that the non-accelerating inflation unemployment rate must not be interpreted as an equilibrium unemployment rate, as in the new Keynesian models, and it is not in contrast with what we argued about the Phillips curve. Indeed, since central banks don't usually speedily adjust the nominal interest rate and their targeted real interest rate is influenced by several factors, different average unemployment rates may be able to avoid accelerating inflation, determining a long-run trade-off between unemployment and wage inflation, which is similar to the one originally advanced by Phillips. So, in a sense, the non-accelerated inflation unemployment rate only shows the unemployment rate that is, in a sense, structurally needed to ensure for a given degree of workers' organization a stable inflation rate and a certain real interest rate when it is aimed at by the central bank. And it is also compatible, for instance, with the recent flattening of the Phillips curve, which is the result of traumatized workers and their weakening in wage bargaining. Well, the rationalization of wage bargaining in terms of the aspiration gap, combined with an inflation targeting by the central bank, may lead to a reaction function which is formally similar to the one advanced by Taylor, but different in its economic meaning. So assume that for a certain degree of workers' organization, the unemployment rate is too low to ensure a targeted real interest rate, together with a stable targeted inflation rate. The central bank may try to fulfill these goals by raising the nominal interest rate, specifically its increase must not only be able to defend the, the targeted real interest rate, but also ensure an increase in the unemployment rate that puts workers' wage claims under control. In fact, in fact only when the actual unemployment rate is equal to the non-accelerated inflation unemployment rate, we will have that the inflation rate does not change. And moreover, only an appropriate level of the unemployment rate can guarantee an inflation rate which is equal to the one decided by the central bank. Therefore, the difference between the actual real interest rate pursued by the central bank and its initial targeted real value, and consequently the required change in the nominal interest rate can be viewed as a function of the difference between the non-accelerated inflation rate and the unemployment rate, and of the difference between the actual inflation rate and the one targeted by the central bank. Namely, a relation can be written that is very similar to the Taylor rule. But, of course, there are several differences between this relation and the new Keynesian one. And the first one is that here the main concern is cost-boost inflation, 
Second, the target real rate is not determined by real factors as in the new consensus model, but is seen as a monetary phenomenon. Of course, the monetary authorities don't decide their policy rates in a vacuum, and so they will take the course of money wages and the conditions of the labor and commodity markets into account. And so, and moreover, we can say that the rate targeted by the central bank in any sense, uh, in no sense, ensure some optimal configuration of the economy. And its changes affect income distribution and the number of unemployment, unemployed workers. Third, the sensitivity of aggregate demand to the rate of interest can be low and varies according to the circumstances. And this is the reason why a change in the sign of monetary policy is often accompanied by fiscal policy moving in the same uh, 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 direction. Finally, the analysis does not refer to a single time, but to a monetary regime setting on average a certain real interest rate as implied by the reference to several wage bargaining rounds. Uh, I can pass to conclude without, because we have no time, without analyzing some extension of this analysis of cost push inflation to an open uh, economy, and so taking into consideration the effect of an appreciation and a depreciation of the uh, exchange uh, rate. I, we can, to conclude, we can say that the classification by, following the classification by Rochon and Satterfield between an activist and a parking it approach to monetary policy, the interpretation of the Taylor rule here advanced the parts from any short-run monetary policy rule that mechanically aims to lean against the wind. However, while sharing with the parking it approach the emphasis on the distributive effects of the monetary policy, it also departs from this approach because no attempt is made to define the proper value of the long-run rate of interest to be set by the central bank. The rate of interest is assumed to be the result of their objects and constraint as influenced by institutional and social economic uh, factors, which does not mean, of course, that we can think of some best monetary uh, policy. For instance, that we can think that for distributive reasons and to fuel uh, economic growth by raising the real wage and giving space to expansionary fiscal policy when the interest rate is lower than the growth rate of the economy, we should fix the interest rate, the real interest rate, to a very low uh, value. That is that the better, the best <laughs> monetary policy, in a sense, is a cheap money policy. But, of course, this cheap money policy requires several conditions, for instance, a control of capital movements and also income policies, in a sense, a specific institutional setting. And so, if we would like to uh, follow a uh, cheap money policy, we must also uh, be sure that these other conditions are uh, present. Um, and we must also take uh, into account that all rules uh, fixed in real terms at any rate implies changes in the nominal interest rate and that these changes in the nominal interest rate can have by itself an effect on the level of activity and on other variables. And so that you must always, in a sense, take into account these effects of the uh, monetary policy, even with a parking in uh, uh, approach and the interactions between the monetary policy and the fiscal policy. Thank you.
Thank you, Sergio. Um, now I'll invite Maria and Steve to join, join you in the front so we can collect a couple of questions. Uh, Esteban. I have uh, uh, one question for each of the presenters, quick questions. Uh, for the first presenter, uh, this is only a, a suggestion. I, I, I missed in the, in the causality the role of financial factors. The fact that the federal fund rates can affect asset prices, stock market, the yield curve. And for example, if you do not take, for example, the effect on or you maintain uh, long-term assets, uh, you may be flatten the yield curve and this is not neutral with respect to the real variables. And uh, the uh, federal funds rate doesn't have the same effect of all financial intermediaries. The need to distinguish several financial intermediaries is a useful point as pointed a long time by Gurley and Shaw. Do you think it would be useful in your model to take this into account? Uh, the second, uh, this brings me to my second comment for Stephen. You mentioned that obviously the new consensus downplays the role of fiscal policy, but it also downplays the role of financial factors. There's, there's no finance. And even, for example, Guillermo Calvo, who's a neoclassical economist, he wrote his book in 2016 about liquidity, uh, liquidity in times of financial crisis, where he said that all financial issues are swept under the rug. Okay, and for the third presenter, my question is the following. I find that the, um, um, that the inflation targeting or the DHG's, DHG uh, dynamic general equilibrium models have a big contradiction. They have a natural rate of interest, so they're Vixelian, but they're built under a new monetary new Walrasian framework. Monetary? New Walrasian framework means that all commodities have their own rate of interest, they have the natural rate of interest, and there are as many natural rates of interest as there are commodities, and it's very difficult to equate all of them because commodities are defined in terms of space, in terms of uh, uh, geogra geography, and in terms of, the, of their own properties. So, in fact, it's not really a question of multiple equilibrium, that the model is indeterminate. How do you solve this issue in your model? Thank you very much. Frankly. First of all, uh, I just want to say that I liked very much the three papers. And then because of that, my main question for Professor Levrero is what was in the two slides about open economy that you jumped because you had no time. <laughs> so you have a little time to look about it in the end. And the second question is, what happens to your formulation in periods in which the distance between the rate, nominal rate of profits and the interest rate starts to change a lot, for instance, if for 20 years you lower the interest rate and something happens, you don't say what, something happens and the net profits of enterprise go up. So these are the two questions. The lack of questions for the other two is because I have no provocation <laughs> because I really enjoy both papers. <laughs> Much yes. I have a, a, a it's actually a clarification question for Stephen, a, a, a brief uh, sort of question that might be based on misinterpreting what you said. So if that's the case, you'll forget what I asked. So first, I think you said something about the caldover loan law being smaller. Uh, and uh, it surprised me because, it, I'm, you know, I'm, maybe I misunderstood, but, you know, I don't think it fits with what you were saying and, you know, and some results actually we presented on that with, with uh, Santiago that it's, you know, it, 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 so we, which we don't see in the American economy. The, the second is that 
And again, I, I, I'm not sure I, I got the whole thing, and so maybe I misinterpreted. This is not the focus, I think, of what you were trying to do. But you said that interest rates, uh, in general, they've been very low for you know, the last 20 years, uh, you know, uh, that, that the highest point now in 20 years. Um, to some extent, it's because uh, demand is not strong enough, and the new consensus people, the people doing the policy, think it's not strong enough, and they need that to stimulate demand. And I think there is some, so if you look at the debate on why interest rates have been low, almost the vast majority, including people that were in charge of, you know, like Bernanke, was the savings lot and stuff related to mostly demographics and the savings side, you know. Uh, the exception was exactly Larry Summers, uh, that, you know, and to some extent Robert Gordon, Robert Gordon is more complicated, sorry, but this, to some extent it was Larry Summers, and, you know, which was on the investment side, and, you know, he admitted, he said post Keynesians are right, uh, Tom Pale is right, those kinds of things, it's sacred stagnation and whatnot. He changed his mind, by the way, so, very strongly, so, uh, and, so, I, I just want to know if that's your explanation for, for low interest rates. So, I, I think that, you know, it's harder to say that that was a general thing of people making the policy. I think that they were somewhat on, on the, and I think a lot of the, the, the reasons for low interest rates were associated to financial instability and then reasons to, you know, to save uh, the financial sector every so often of, of you know, the crisis. M maybe I'm wrong, maybe I misinterpreted, so. Sorry, long comment. So do you prefer to answer, or can we collect yeah. one more? Can, can I do a question to yeah, Christina? Sure, sure. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, then, and then you guys answer. <laughs> so I, I uh, no, I, I would like only to, uh, when you show your uh, impulse uh, reaction functions uh, after a monetary policy shock, you have that an increase, if I remember well, uh, when you have an increase in the federal funds rate, you have an, in, uh, an increase in the wage share. Yes. So, um, with uh, Matteo De Lady and also now with Antonino Lofaro, so <laughs> one of the other guys that you quoted in your presentation, uh, we have the result that a monetary policy shock uh, will lead to a fall in the real wages due to an increase in the level of prices on impact, of course. And uh, so, uh, in a sense, the so-called price puzzle. And so, of course, uh, I think that you, take, you must take this into consideration because the increase in the wage share that you see after the monetary policy shock can be only due to the fact that labor productivity during the crisis falls much uh, um, uh, more than the fall in the real wage. And so you have, so I think that because you are discussing also on the effect of the change in the wage share on the aggregate demand, so you must take, I think, this into consideration. But I would, perhaps I have not understood well uh, your uh, slides, so uh, I would like to know this. Sorry. I, I no am problem. curious <laughs> to, uh, to have your answer. Okay, so maybe I will start with uh, not the other one. Okay. <laughs> okay, so maybe I will start with uh, Professor Livrero's question which is actually very interesting. Uh, Joanna presented this uh, uh, paper at uh, SASE before, and that's the puzzling fact that the Marxist also pointed out uh, in the session. Uh, actually, when you do a positive monetary policy shock, what we get is a transitory uh, increase in the wage share that later is then absorbed. And this is, uh, you pointed out uh, correctly, this is exactly the same result as uh, Stefano and Antonino find in their paper, and also in line with the paper of uh, Cantore, which is a uh, mainstream uh, Italian uh, economist that point out that exactly to this fact, because uh, during the recession uh, and during uh, uh, a contractionist monetary policy shock, real wages will fall, absolutely right, because obviously, even if nominal wages go up, 
the level of prices uh, go up even more, so uh, wages will most often lose, so real wages goes down, but uh, uh, productivity goes down even harder, so even, uh, even more, and that's because uh, output uh, replies to uh, monetary policy much faster than, uh, uh, than employment, and so this explains this uh, puzzling, puzzling result that we get. Uh, one idea would be uh, extending this analysis to include uh, money wages or real wages and uh, employment instead of a simply wage share. So this could be one more robustness check or one, one more extension of this paper. Uh, uh, then the comment on asset prices, uh, you're absolutely right, but one uh, drawback from this type of analysis is that we cannot uh, distinguish between such as we, you can do with agent-based models, stock focal consistent models between different types of agents. So it would be hard to say, oh, this, this is the person benefiting from it, and this is a household, this gov what happens with different uh, agents, if I get correctly. Uh, one possibility, which I have done, is including, for instance, different types of uh, prices in this analysis. So you see what happens when you do a monetary policy shock or a uh, shock in distribution or these autonomous demand variables. And what uh, I got so far is that uh, when you do a positive monetary policy shock, there is a decrease uh, in the level of house prices, which is then the channel through which monetary policy affects private residential investment. And this also leads to a positive uh, uh, shock in rent of uh, uh, houses. And this can be explained either by the dynamics of uh, uh, supply and demand of the housing market itself, but also by uh, agents that try to align their, their gains uh, uh, from, uh, from markets, uh, also if they own a house. So they will rent uh, using a higher price. They will try to get a higher price for the house because everybody in the market is getting uh, much more money for, for, for lending money. So uh, this is something that I could do. Uh, and I think it's a good idea actually to, to consider both long and, uh, and short term rates and see how they, how they behave in future work. So thank you for your, for your suggestion. Uh, okay, uh, with respect to the first uh, uh, question, I think that I have no problem uh, because uh, uh, in my uh, rule, because I follow a classical <laughs> approach, so I don't have any uh, capital endowment uh, taken as given uh, as a single monitor or as a vector of different capital goods, which implies that you must take it account in order to determine the equilibrium, the changes of derivative prices over time, and so that you can different open rate of interest. But of course, when you take a numerator, you will have a, at any rate a uniform uh, rate uh, of profit. But th these are very uh, complex <laughs> elements uh, uh, related to the uh, intertemporal general equilibrium. I think that, uh, yes, uh, if we look to the new Keynesian model, you have these two possibilities, or some problems of multiple equilibria, which is a, a problem from, from those models, or they refer, at any rate, to a single natural rate of interest. If you look at Woodford, if you read Woodford, you see in several pages, passages in Woodford the, that you find an idea of capital as a single magnitude. So you have, as in several recent macroeconomic models, indeed you have this idea of, uh, uh, of capital as a single magnitude. And so my criticism and the criticism of Garignani and others uh, directly apply to, uh, uh, to the model. Uh, with respect to the question of uh, uh, Franklin, uh, well, um, we can consider an effect of uh, um, a change in the exchange, exchange rate uh, simply introducing, for instance, in the, in, in the price system, uh, a vector of imported goods, 
uh, and a vector of prices of imported goods and the nominal exchange rate, and you can analyze in this way uh, the effect that you can have uh, by a change in the exchange rate. So you can say that if you achieve this change in the exchange rate without any change in the interest rate, which is something that you can have, uh, in this case, for instance, if you have a, a, an appreciation of the exchange rate, you uh, will have for the same rate of profits an increase in the real wage. If uh, you have, if you achieve this uh, uh, increase, uh, this appreciation of the exchange rate by means of an increase in the interest rate, uh, you must, I think, you must take into account in order to understand what will uh, uh, occur to the real wage, both these two, um, uh, the effect of both these two changes in the uh, elements of cost uh, of production. And so, it, according to the circumstances, uh, an effect can prevail, and in other circumstances, another effect can uh, prevail. The case of the depreciation, of course, is more complex, because when you have a depreciation, you probably have a strong, you can have a strong reaction of the workers to a fall in the real wage, so you can have a continuous uh, uh, depreciation of the exchange rate, and so I think that the things are more uh, complex. Of course, now I am thinking to some general cases. Case, you can have uh, some specific uh, um, elements that you must take into account. For, exa for example, uh, the case in which, um, as uh, in uh, Argentina, uh, the, uh, uh, you have a, a, a great importance of uh, tradable goods whose price are fixed in the international markets. So in this case, uh, of course, you must take uh, into account also this uh, element when discuss the effect of the uh, change in the exchange, uh, in the exchange rate. Um, I have some doubt on some recent models that analyze uh, this uh, effect uh, following a classical uh, approach, but I think that this can be something that we will discuss in the future. Um, with respect to your other question, I was so sure that you uh, would ask me something about this that I, I have prepared some slides. <laughs> because we have discussed about, you are discussing about this point. Uh, so, I think that when we discuss about what happened to income distribution in the last decades, a true problem, in a sense, for the monetary explanation of distribution arises only from the end of the 1990 onwards. Because if you look to the data of the, this is a very simple calculation of the ex post um, rate of profits, the blue line, and then you have the movements of some uh, uh, interest rate, okay, for a bond of 10 years and uh, bonds for um, a, a, a corporate bond and so on, okay. So uh, if you look to the data, um, uh, you must, I think that you must think. Uh, on average. So, after the great increase in the rate of interest after, uh, with uh, workers' monetary policy, the real rate of interest remains at a very high level with respect to what you have had before for a, a sufficient long period of time. That explains uh, uh, very well the fall that you have had in the way share, and it is seen also by this graph, the increase that you have had in the rate of profits. Because at the same time, you have had also a fall in the capital output ratio, okay, in those, in those years. Okay, but when you pass to analyze what occurred after the, uh, yes, from the 2000 onwards, I think that it is not so clear that you continue to have an increase in the rate of profits. Of course, here we are, we are speaking of an ex-post 
<laughs> rate of profit. So what would occur to the normal rate of profit, we don't know. Okay, so in this, in this ex post rate of profit, you have the effect of quasi rents, of changes, of uh, prices, of market prices, which are different from the natural prices. Uh, you have an effect uh, of, you know, uh, a change in the degree of utilization of cap productive capacity. So it is, okay. If you look to the, so at any rate you have the rate of interest that continues to fall, okay, so on average they pass to a, a low level, not zero, but low level, uh, and you have a rate of profit that remain constant. So you have an increase in the normal profit of enterprise, and you must in a sense, explain this increase. One explanation can be, and this is suggested also by this graph, one explanation can be an increase in the risk elements, uh, increasing the normal profit of enterprise. But I am working, and you know this, I am working on this, on this point. I also think that uh, there are other two elements that can have a, a, a role. The first is the process of concentration and perhaps a higher um, degree of monopoly in the United States, but, and uh, also something related to patents. Uh, because after, uh, precisely after the 2000, um, the 2000, you have a very strong increase in the number of patents. So I mean that perhaps you have an increase in what you can call the extra profits, okay, due to innovative activity. And so I think that this can be elements that can give a, um, an explanation, okay, but you know, this is, this is a point that must be discussed. Okay, so just a few quick comments. I know it's getting late. Uh, with respect to Esteban's question about finance and the mainstream, so this is about the mainstream. I don't really identify with the mainstream, but I'll try. So yes, the mainstream sweeps finance under the rug m much of the time, but not always. I mean, I lived through, actually it was relevant for me because I spent a lot of my um, career research career looking at uh, finance matters kinds of questions, particularly on business investment. And you know, this, this kind of translated into monetary policy with that credit channel discussion, which is really you know, Bernanke, Gertler, Gilchrist, these people in the 90s. Uh, and and uh, so they did have this, you know, after the, great, uh, after the uh, housing crisis in the US, then there's more people thinking about you know, uh, mortgages and these kinds of things going on, although I can't immediately think about how that ties in directly to monetary policy. If I wanted to link it to my comments here, I don't think it really changes anything. So if you think about the traditional three equation model or even some extensions, the new Keynesian extensions, they focus on the old intertemporal substitution issues, uh, which is primarily a Euler equation uh, for consumption, but if somebody's a little more sophisticated, they put some kind of interest sensitivity of investment into the model. But if you added credit, what would you, you get the same thing. You get the same point that it's the level of interest rates that determines the level of demand. So if you need to, to stimulate demand, you have to, you have to uh, cut interest rates, eventually get to the, uh, the zero lower bound. Uh, with respect to Matthias's question, uh, we should probably talk offline about Caldor Verdun. It really was, I, I mentioned it because it was relevant to that productivity equation. You know, our, my interpretation with Alejandro, which is in the other paper, is that the more traditional way of look, typical way of looking at this is some kind of correlation between the growth rate of the economy on the, uh, on the growth rate of productivity is, is actually somewhat misleading if you have this level economy affecting the growth rate of the economy and that confounds the relationship. And it is the case that when we had a direct estimate of the growth of output on the growth of productivity, it came in very, very weak in our empirical work. I, it just is uh, in, in this context. Uh, with respect to the, some of the other questions about the low interest rates and weak aggregate demand, you know, Bernanke talked about the global saving glut. 
Um, and I always thought that was such a strange comment. How can there be a saving glut? I mean, saving is greater, is equal to investment or investment plus the government deficit plus the current account deficit or something like that. So uh, in some ways, I mean, forget about the, the complications, the simple model. Saving cannot be greater than investment. There can be no glut of saving. So to me, when, when Bernanke's talking about a global saving glut, he's talking about weak aggregate demand uh, in, in the broad sense. There's not enough demand around, whether that's due to you know, Chinese being worried about whether they can pay for their medical costs or things like that is, you know, you know goes into this. I mean, broadly on Summers, I, I feel like Summers, when he was talking about secular stagnation, I more or less was on board. It was interesting that he would keep he would keep kind of generalizing this. First off, it was kind of things like um, uh, the falling capital output ratio, or there was this demographic story. But then I, I heard him talk about it several times, and he kept adding things, including inequality. At the end, he, he, would, he would say rising income inequality is leading to weak aggregate demand. But, but, so there I was with him, but then it would always be, and therefore we might be at the zero lower bound a lot. Uh, and uh, that, that I just think that that issue has been has been overemphasized, and so you see uh, oh, one one last quick story, 30 seconds, I promise, which is I gave a fiscal policy paper uh, showing fiscal policy kind of mattered a lot, <laughs> and I actually presented it at the IMF some years ago, and uh, somebody raised his hand. Well, how can this be that it mattered in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s? We were not at the zero lower bound. Uh, it, it was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And so, uh, you know, this is just taken on. And la last thing is, is financial instability. I didn't say anything about it, probably I should. I mean, in, in the monetary policy, uh, re reacting to financial instability surely is an important uh, and significant thing, and it was a big part of what happened. Whether it be lender of last resort or cutting interest rates or quantitative easing, the, these kinds of issues. Containing the, the downside of financial instability is an important part. I mean, you know, I was a uh, colleague and, and co-author of Hyman Minsky, so I haven't forgotten that part of myself. Uh, oh, and oh, I do have one last comment. Let the record show that I came to Rio de Janeiro, I spoke at the Federal University, and I did not provoke Franklin Serrano. <laughs> 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 So I don't think we have time for another round of questions. So thank you all for this very productive session. Uh, just a reminder, tomorrow we start at 8.30. Okay, so have a good night. 8.30, yeah. <laughs>